Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates Inside Science Series. I'm your host, Paul Vogelsang, and this is episode number 198. As part of our Smithsonian Associates Inside Science Series, our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is Dr. David Reich. David Reich is author of the new book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. David Reich explains the significance this new technical innovation has had in the study of human history and prehistory. The people who live in a particular place today almost never exclusively descend from the people who lived in that same place far in the past. That, of course, is our guest today, Dr. David Reich, who will be at the Smithsonian Associates Program presenting his new book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past, Thursday, April 26, 2018, at the National Museum of the American Indian. Please join me in welcoming to the Not Old Better Show via Skype, Dr. David Reich. Well, David Reich, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Well, briefly, tell us about your upcoming Smithsonian presentation. Well, I'm going to be talking about the my new book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past. And really what this book is about is the massive technological um, improvements that have happened in the last 10 years, which have made it possible to regularly get DNA sequence out of uh, bones that are thousands or even tens of thousands of years old. And this development has really transformed our understanding of the deep past and made it possible to ask and answer questions that were not simply not possible to answer before. And there's been a real boom in ancient DNA as a result of these developments that makes it possible to now study well more than a thousand people with genome-wide data from, from ancient people and learn about the past. And so that's what my talk's going to be ba- about. I'm going to talk, I'm going to read some passages from my book. I'm going to tell some of the stories in my book about the deep population his, of his, history of India, about Neanderthals and Denisovans, other archaic humans, and about uh, the ancient peoples of uh, Europe. Well, thank you for that. I think it's going to be an excellent session there at the Smithsonian. I'm, I'm interested in diving into that just a little bit and, and ask you, from the standpoint of ancient, ancient DNA, what are some of your most important ancient DNA-related uh, discoveries? You mentioned Neanderthals. I wonder if that's one you might include. Yeah, so I had the opportunity to be involved in a collaboration led by Svante Pabo at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, Germany. He called me in 2006 or wrote to me and asked me, uh, would you like to be involved in the analysis of the ancient DNA from uh, these archaic humans that we're clearly obtaining here in Germany? Um, and my colleague and I, with whom I run my lab, uh, Nick Patterson, uh, really jumped at the opportunity. We thought this was the best data in the world, um, and we decided to work on this with all of our own energy, which we did really for the next seven years, first on this Neanderthal project and then on a series of follow-up projects led by Svante Pabo's group. So the role that I and my colleagues took in this study was to try to compare the genome sequence of the Neanderthal to that of living humans and see how the Neanderthal was related. And that was a huge opportunity because we didn't have any before any DNA from, from people like this. And we could suddenly see that these Neanderthals were more closely related to some people today than to others. There's even some evidence of some interbreeding. That's right. So Neanderthals interbred with the ancestors of all non-Africans, uh, but hardly at all with the ancestors of Africans. And so as a result, Neanderthals are a little bit more closely related to non-Africans than Africans. And there's all sorts of lines of evidence making it clear that Neanderthals are in fact more closely related to non-Africans than to Africans. This would seem to have changed some of the established wisdom about human history. How did it do that? Well, I think there was a pendulum swing. Um, at some point, there was a view that that humans who, who have been spread all around the old world for the last almost two million years had evolved in each place um, separately to become the modern humans we see all around the world today, Europeans and East Asians and Africans and South Asians and Australians and so on. And so the idea was there was local uh, a multi-regional evolution where the ancient peoples who had been established there for more than two million years um, became um, after uh, became and evolved into the present day people in each of those places. So in the 80s and 90s, there was a pendulum swing toward 
uh, making it very clear that the uh, after sometime after 60 or 50,000 years ago, there was a massive migration of modern humans who are anatomically modern humans like us out of Africa and displacing all these other groups. So that Africa was our homeland, which is definitely clearly the case, and that modern humans today are exclusively descended from a late secondary migration out of Africa. So that became when I was a graduate student that was the orthodoxy and that uh, my I was trained in the view that all ancestry of people today both outside and inside Africa is from this modern human expansion out of Africa but I think that pendulum swing went too far and what the Neanderthal sequence shows us is in fact there was a little bit of interbreeding with local humans during this expansion we are with David Reich who is the author of who we are and how we got here. David Reich will be appearing at the Smithsonian Associates Program coming up very soon. He is also a professor of genetics at Harvard University. Again, David Reich, thanks so much for joining us. But tell us a little bit more about this uh, this idea of ancient DNA and how it might reveal a history of disparity between different populations. Yeah. So one of the things that ancient DNA does is it, that it conveys not just how people are related to each other, but also it actually contains within it the imprint of past inequality in, in really very interesting and surprising ways. So one example of this is an example that we know of also from history books, which is the history of inequality between Native Americans, Europeans, and Africans in the Americas. If you look at people from Antioquia, from, from Medellin in Colombia, and you look at their ancestry on the entirely female line, it's 40 to 1, or it's almost entirely from Native Americans. If you look at the ancestry on the entirely male line, it's almost entirely from Europeans. And what this reflects is a history of multiple waves of male migration from Europe uh, to the Americas, where the European males had preferential access to the local females and displaced the local males after generation after generation. So you can see writ in the genomes of um, mestizos in the Americas and also African Americans, the history of inequality between people of different ancestries. So you can also see much deeper in time when we don't have history books to confirm it, but you can also see equally clearly from the DNA history of these inequalities. My most favorite example, which is really truly impressive, is the reconstruction of the history of human populations over the last 50,000 years based on comparing Y chromosomes, which are passed down from father to son to son, to mitochondrial DNA, which are passed down from mother to daughter to daughter to daughter. And based on the way people are related on the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome, we can reconstruct a what the population size was like at each point in the past. And what we can see is that on the mitochondrial DNA, it's very clear that the human population was expanding dramatically for the last 50,000 years, quite dramatically after 50,000 years ago, and even more dramatically after 10,000 years ago with the expansion of af agriculture. But on the Y chromosome, while you see the 50,000-year-old expansion, there's a, and you see the 10,000-year-old expansion, there's a huge crash 5,000 years ago. And you don't see this in the mitochondrial DNA, and this corresponds to the time of the Bronze Age, uh, the first period in, known from archaeology of extreme inequality amongst people, where you see great wealth accumulations in graves related to the sourcing of goods like metals from very far away. And this too seems to correspond to a time when single males were able to have very large numbers of children and to pass their social prestige on to their male children who then had very large numbers of children as well. And this happened in multiple parts of Eurasia and East Asia and in Europe and elsewhere, showing that this was really an economically or technologically driven or lifestyle driven phenomenon that was causing, that was reflecting inequality in the past that we can't read about in the books, but we can see it in the DNA. I have a question about the business part of what you do, uh, certainly the genealogy business, uh, genealogy history, and the testing of geneal genealogy, has that cost has come down dramatically, making for massive changes in, the, in that uh, genealogy business model. I wonder how much it costs to do your work on ancient DNA, which I can't imagine is necessarily the same as uh, the, the other more uh, non-academic genealogy business, but how has that cost shift been a factor in your work? Yeah, so I think that the not the non the non academic genealogy businesses mm -hmm. typically you can pay fifty or a hundred dollars yes. for to, <laughs> to to have your genome effectively sequenced um, and to learn about a lot of these same questions with regard to how your genome relates to other people's 
genomes who have been looked at and exist in the database. And uh, ancient DNA is, of course, much more uh, involved. The samples are incredibly degraded and they need to be processed in clean rooms. Um, but for, uh, for us, the costs of the materials we use are less than about $200 per sample. Mm. Um, and so there's, of course, additional costs related to the personnel and paying the personnel to work on it. But the actual cost to, to do this is actually quite small because of a series of improvements that we and others have implemented that make it possible to do this type of work efficiency, efficiently. And so, for example, our, our, our laboratory is processing about 3,000 new samples a year at this rate, and there's been an exponential increase in the rate of processing. Um, the number of samples with genome-wide ancient DNA hit was above, the first sample was published in 2010. Uh, it went above, it, went, it got to 10 in 2013. It got to 100 in 2014. Um, it got to a thousand just a month ago. And so it's really rapidly increasing. Hmm. In my research of you, I've read that you say ancient DNA has changed the way we see archaeology. I, I think that's really uh, just potentially very interesting. What do, you, what do you mean by that? And are archaeologists okay with this? Or are they somehow frustrated by some of this uh, kind of analysis that you're doing? Well, I think that this is a true revolution. Mm -hmm. um, it, and I think that archaeologists uh, broadly recognize this. Archaeologists are really, in my experience, um, extraordinary people who are deeply interested in finding out as much as they can about prehistory um, and are working with limited material. And so when a, a new technology like this comes along, which is provides such powerful and almost unexpectedly powerful information about prehistory, archaeologists are, of course, excited because they're thirsty for knowledge of the past. So... There have in the past been other scientific revolutions in archaeology. The first big one started in 1949 with the discovery that you could get a direct data on a sample through radiocarbon dating, um, a, a technology developed by um, uh, Libby. And so this was a revolutionary technology and upended a lot of orthodoxies in archaeology. For example, in, in Europe, it used to be thought that the big stone monuments of northwest and northern Europe, the megaliths, would have bit, came after the great stone monuments of the Near East, like the pyramids, because the thought was all civilization and all impressive things must come from the Near East. But in fact, they're older. Um, and um, this radiocarbon dating revolution, as chronicled by, by Colin Renfrew and others, really changed the way people think about the past, what the order of things was. It changed people's whole sense of time scales. And after that, archaeologists have not seen prehistory the same way. Genetics is doing the same, and a concrete example of this is with respect to the question about how change happens in, in, in prehistory. So when archaeologists are looking at a site and see a very dramatic change in the pottery, site, site, pottery type across a, at a particular site or broadly across a region, there's always been an argument about whether this is primarily mediated by movements of people or spread an adaptation of ideas. And genetics can answer that. It can tell you have new people arrived. And the orthodoxy prior to the ancient DNA revolution was that it's very rare in human history that changes in, in, in styles of material artifacts are due to movements of people. And what the genetics has shown again and again is that there have been great migrations again and again in the past um, that have been responsible for changing material cultures. So I think it's giving us a sense of how important large-scale movements of people have been in history, and it's allowing us to study that directly for the first time. I think that in answer to your question also, it's very interesting um, that I think that geneticists are not really trained to think, speak with nuance about uh, the, the topics that, that we're talking about. We don't know a great deal about some of the ancient cultures that we know about, but we do have access to this very important scientific instrument. So I think it's incumbent on us as geneticists to try to work with archaeologists who have knowledge about the topics to try to write papers that communicate well to the archaeological communities and uh, communicate um, useful information that they can use in their own thinking about prehistory. Finally, uh, David Reich, I, I know you're very busy and, and we very much appreciate your time, but I, I note in your excellent book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, which, which I read and, and really enjoyed, you, you conclude the book by saying, Exploding Stereotypes undercutting prejudice, 
and highlighting the connections among peoples not previously known to be related is very important to you. It's also a very optimistic statement. Are you still as optimistic now as you were when you first started writing the book? Even more so. So I'm uh, this. I'm a big booster for this field, mm-hmm. um, and I think that um, the overwhelming effect of the ancient DNA discoveries has been to show that the people who thought they knew what was going on in prehistory and they thought that what they knew about that they thought they knew what the nature of the relationships amongst existing human populations are, all of those people have been wrong, including me. And so I think that the ancient DNA data is teaching us great humility. It's teaching us that there's much more in the world than we knew about. There's much more in the past than we knew about, that we really shouldn't be prejudging and guessing and thinking we knew what was going on in prehistory. We should listen to the data. And our stereotypes that we might have brought to these questions, they're almost certainly wrong. Classic stereotypes of groups uh, as being separated from each other uh, for ages and ages and not mixing with their neighbors, those are all wrong. Almost every human group without exception is mixed. David Reich, author of Who We Are and How We Got Here, and uh, professor of uh, genetics at Harvard University, will be at the Smithsonian Associates Program coming up. But David Reich, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for talking with me. Of course. My thanks to our guest today, Dr. David Reich, who will be at the Smithsonian Associates Program presenting his new book, Who We Are and How We Got Here, Ancient DNA and the New Science of the Human Past, in his program, April 26, 2018, at the National Museum of the American Indian. My thanks as well to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support our interviews. As usual, we'll post links to everything, and also, as usual, my thanks to you, the listeners, for joining me today. Your time is valuable, and I'm grateful you're spending some of it with me. I'm always interested in your feedback, and you can leave that at iTunes, Google Play, or send me an email at info at notold-better.com. Stay tuned for our next show, another great one, as we talk about better, the Not Old Better Show. Thanks, everybody. Oh, and remember to check out genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S for great genealogy newspaper articles, history, and data, and to support the show. That's genealogybank.com slash N-O-B-S. Thank you.